Good morning, everyone. This is April with the LOINC team. We're going to go ahead and get started with our co combined committee meeting morning session. We're happy to have everyone here today. There are a lot of attendees. We're excited that everyone is able to make it. Uh, if you are a committee member, please click the button to raise your hand so we can bring you on as a panelist. You'll notice your screen will refresh. Uh, not to worry, you'll be right back into the meeting. Uh, a couple of guidelines, the audience will be muted during the entire session, but you can submit questions through the Q&A button on your screen. The chat box has been disabled. Um, committee members, like I mentioned, will be able to mute and unmute as needed. David and Jamie from the LOINC team will collect and share all of the questions that are submitted, and we will pose those at the, likely at the end of the topics that are being discussed. If you have a technical question, please ensure that you preface your question with the term tech or technical so we can make sure that those get addressed um, more immediately. I will now turn over to Swapna, who is going to start this meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, April. I'm going to share my screen. Again, I'm going to do one more check to make sure I'm showing the right thing, just because I've also, I, the same problem that you had last week where you lost the green bar that shows you which, uh, which screen is being shared. Yes, um, that happens. I've noticed when you start recording, the green bar goes away. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, all right, so are you seeing the correct screen? Or you're seeing the two? Yes, uh, LOINC updates your one screen. Perfect, okay, excellent. So uh, thank you and welcome back everybody. Um, again, uh, my name is Swapna Abiyankar and I'm the interim director for LOINC and uh, this is the combined clinical and uh, lab meeting. And I'd like to give you um, some updates basically about uh, lots of different things actually over the next you know 20 to 25 minutes or so. Um, so, whoops, sorry, just a jump in. So I'd like to start off uh, with some thank yous. And so uh, starting with our funders, um, so everyone who has made the creation and maintenance of LOINC uh, possible, um, you have our, um, you know, most appreciation and thanks. And then uh, thank you to the LOINC team. Uh, and I have, uh, you know, little pictures of everybody here and the little key so you can see what everybody does. And the whole team has done such a tremendous job on, you know, basically everything that working on the whole, like through the pandemic and then putting this conference together. And I just wanted to, you know, give a special thank you to everybody. Um, we're actually growing. So by the end of the year, we're hoping to have two more clinical terminology developers for a total of six. So we'll essentially be doubling our uh, terminology team and then also a new director on board. Um, and if we were in person, we would have gone around the room and done intros, uh, but unfortunately, given the virtual platform and how many people we have, we won't be able to do that this time. Um, but I did want to go ahead and show the slides so that you could put some faces with some names. And then thank you to all of our volunteers. So we have several different LOINC committee, uh, LOINC committees, sorry. Um, so lab and clinical, as well as uh, the radiology committee, the nursing subcommittee, and the document ontology subcommittee. Um, we also have a whole host of international translators who provide all of the linguistic variants uh, for LOINC that are published with each release. And, um, you know, so we really appreciate all of that work that everybody's doing. And then, of course, the LOINC user community, uh, without whom LOINC would not be possible. So thank you um, to everybody. And then I'd just like to pause for a moment um, to remember Mike Waters, a uh, friend and colleague um, who passed away suddenly on September 27, 2020. Um, and I would appreciate it if everybody could join me in just a moment of silence for Mike. So thank you for participating in that. And uh, we've, we've truly lost a friend and a great colleague. Um, okay, so uh, switching gears a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about the yearly conference and meeting schedule. And so originally, uh, sort of pre-COVID, we had planned to have two conferences a year, 
that would each be three days. So we got two days for committee meetings and one for workshops. Um, the idea had been in the spring, we would have a rotating schedule between Indianapolis and Salt Lake City in the US. And then in the fall, uh, we would have a meeting outside the US. And then in between, we had planned on having two half or full day virtual committee meetings um, so that we could talk about, you know, different types of business that comes up. Um, then, of course, the pandemic came along, and so we had to cancel our March conference, and we had a COVID webinar instead. Um, and then we actually haven't held any of the half or full day committee meetings, but we have been having monthly uh, lab phone calls, actually, lab committee phone calls, as well as document ontology, and the nursing subcommittee has been meeting monthly for actually the last few years. Um, and so we, you know, basically sort of wondering what to do going forward. And so this conference, we made it four shorter days rather than three long days, uh, just to maximize participation from all over the world. Um, and we just, you know, we thought that um, having the shorter days and in the morning in US East Coast time might make it a little bit easier for more people uh, to be able to join. We've also introduced the combined lab and clinical committee meeting, which is today, um, rather than having entirely separate lab and clinical meetings. And then we also have a mix of meetings and workshops on most days. And so we're trying to figure out starting next year, should we go back to fully separate meetings? Should we have you know, the workshops on an entirely separate day and then have the meetings on different days? Um, and then do we need the half or full day committee meetings in between that we had originally planned, uh, but that you know, haven't actually happened uh, to date? And it seems like the phone calls are going well, and maybe what we should do is introduce a, uh, like a quarterly clinical committee meeting phone call uh, into the schedule as well, instead of having like a whole half or full day meeting. Um, so I wanted to pause there for a second and see if anybody has any feedback or questions. Then we also have a little uh, poll. So this is my first webinar poll. So uh, we'll see how this goes. So please go ahead and fill this out. And I realize this is, you know, it's still obviously very early in the conference. And so it's hard to say what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. And so we're actually gonna ask the same questions again towards the end of the week during the lab and clinical committee meetings. Um, are there any comments in the Q&A or um, does anybody? Any questions at this moment and um, we've got about half of the attendees have voted. So we'll give it just a minute or two more. Okay. Uh, question three is ambiguous. Uh, do we need full or half day virtual committee meetings in between conferences? So, Swapna, you wanna expand on that? Sure. And so the original plan, and let me just go back one slide. Whoops. Uh -oh. So originally in between the two conferences a year, we had planned to hold half or full day uh, virtual clinical committee meetings um, because several years ago, we had actually had four meetings a year, two lab and two clinical. And so that got to be a little bit too much. And so we decided to have the two a year, but then we're thinking of having the um, you know, in between just like a half day meeting or so if there are topics that came up that needed to be discussed. Swap, so, now this is Jamie. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question about whether or not there's going to be an option to attend the workshops virtually or will they be in person only in the future, I guess. So that's a great question. Um, that's definitely something that we've been thinking about. I think, you know, obviously they each have their benefits. So in person, um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's really great to be able to, you know, get to know people better and to have the extra face-to-face -face time, but then virtually we get to reach so many more people. And so the answer is we're not sure. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we would like to offer that. Um, but then also, you know, if we can also definitely have the in-person meetings. So we're, we're looking into it and partly it depends on where we have the conference and what's technologically feasible. Okay, so, um, so the early results show, well, I guess everybody can see them, right? So um, about half of the people voted for some combined, some separate in terms of the committee meetings. 41% um, for mix of meetings and workshops each day. And then no opinion so far on the half and full day uh, virtual meetings in between the conference. So thank you everybody who participated in that. Um, 
All right, so, whoops, sorry. Okay, so next, so save the dates. So we have our dates, our approximate dates for our spring and our fall conference for next year. Um, you know, as I just mentioned, this conference is four days and you can see the dates that we've saved are three days, but you know, that might, we might adjust that a little bit. But anyway, um, so in March, we are almost certain to have a virtual conference. Uh, so March 9th through 11th, most likely. And then next November, and I really hope this works out, we are hoping to actually have an in-person conference uh, in France hosted by Bayer Mariu. Um, and so we're super excited about that. And hopefully, um, you know, global health conditions will allow us to have that conference. And then if you are interested in hosting a LINC conference going forward um, in 2022 or beyond, um, you can send us your proposal and I have the link right there. All right, so what have we been up to? Um, it's, I wasn't quite sure where to start because our last meeting, uh, our last in-person meeting was you know, a year ago. And so I decided to start a little bit back then. So basically um, we worked on a strategic plan and that was actually spearheaded by Terry Cullen, uh, who was my co-interim director um, for about eight or nine months. Um, and she, you know, she did an amazing job with the strategic plan. And so from October through December of 2019, um, we held listening sessions with more than 100 uh, different stakeholders. Um, some were individuals, some were groups of people, and, you know, just sort of across the board of um, anybody who uses or, um, you know, has a stake in LOINC. Um, and then we also evaluated the current state of where things stand with, you know, like technology and infrastructure and resources, and then published the strategic plan in early 2020. And then there's actually a public summary uh, for anybody who's interested. And I have a link to that in the slides. And I think the slides will be posted either uh, today or in the next uh, couple of days. Um, just a little bit about our June 2020 release, so that was 2.68. Um, that included exactly 93,600 terms, uh, including about 1,200 new terms, including um, about 700, well, not about, but 747 lab, 244 clinical, and 240 survey. Um, lots of terms related to the pandemic, both on the lab side as well as the clinical side, and Jamie and David will be talking about that a little bit more uh, after this update. Um, also in the June release, um, so several things were different files. So for the link part link file, um, which has the links between every published link term and all of the parts that are linked to it, we actually split it into two for the June release into primary and supplementary. Uh, the primary file contains the six core parts as well as radiology and documentology part links. And then the supplementary file contains basically everything else. So core component, challenge, suffix, divisor, um, et cetera. And the reason, well, two reasons that we split it. One is because uh, the file was huge and actually now the two separate ones are still quite large, um, but they're a little bit more manageable. And then two, um, it, it was a little bit confusing to have all of the different part links in one file. Um, and so it, I think splitting it up, especially when people just look at the primary one, um, it makes more sense in terms of why the specific uh, parts that are in there are linked to the specific terms. Um, uh, we continue to publish the groups and so are looking for feedback on, you know, are people using them? Should we continue to publish them? Which ones are important? Which ones should we add? Um, and we are actually rolling out a new search link um, soon, and I'm, uh, we're going to be doing a little uh, demonstration of it later on, uh, but the groups will now be searchable. And so I'm really excited about that because I think um, people will finally have the opportunity to actually see what's in the groups um, in a more user-friendly format and then give us feedback on you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, we're also looking for feedback on the multi-axial hierarchy. You know, we've continued to make improvements um, in terms of the structure and um, just are wondering, you know, is anybody using it? How can we improve it? And then the change snapshot files are something that we introduced a couple of uh, releases ago. And we have a term change snapshot and a part change snapshot. And at this point, it basically includes, or each file includes all of the terms or parts whose status changed uh, since the last release. 
So definitely looking for feedback. So um, if, you know, if you've used these files, please let us know what you think. And then we also have um, a second little poll here. Um, so if April or Jennifer, if you guys could show that. Excellent. So this poll is basically asking which of the following release files uh, you've used, and there's some specific files listed there. And so I think, you know, this feedback will be tremendously useful to us in terms of deciding what to focus on um, going forward. And we're not going to, you know, it's not like we're going to stop publishing any of these files immediately because people didn't vote for them, but <laughs> we're just trying to get a sense of who is using what. Um, so if you could vote, that would be awesome. Yes. Hi, <laughs> Pam. Hi, Swapna. <laughs> How are you? Okay. Good, welcome. So my one thought is um, on the groups, I think that we're coming across more use cases that they are going to be popular in the future. My question for you at the moment is, since we have done some prototype groups for Reagan Streif and, and there have been some added by other um, subcommittees and such, I wondered how are the updates going? We were hoping that those would be automatic updates uh, based on the descriptions that we gave when there are new releases. Do you know if, if is that working? Yeah, so, well, it should be, um, and I guess if it's not, Have we audited know. it? That would be the, have we audited it? And we have not. Um, so the Loink team has not audited to see, um, you know, well, okay, so we basically have an automated process for how the groups are created. And so we have been, you know, with every release, the terms that are included in the groups get updated either because the query is pulling them in or for specific ones like um, social determinants or smoking status, ones like that, we actually go in before each release and tag specific terms to make sure that they're pulled in to the groups. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there's stuff that's missing, um, but I guess we haven't done a diff in terms of, you know, what outside groups originally published and um, I guess what we have included in the groups. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. It I'm does, in. yes. And I, I'm asking it with the hindsight of what all we discovered with the um, top 2000. It was populated once and we didn't realize how much it was being used by the industry. And we're getting, you know, in past one conferences, we've been talking about retiring it only to find out, no, oh, many people are using it. Yet it's an outdated file. So, right. Right, and that is something that we are working on. So um, we, you know, that is very much on the, you know, close radar. Um, and we have a couple of data sources and that's something that we wanna start working on, you know, in the next, well, probably after the December release at some point, um, but that's uh, updating the top 2000, but I totally agree with you. And I think it's really important for us to know if anyone is using the groups and how, and, you know, perhaps one way forward would be to focus on the ones that people are using um, and that we could, you know, expand upon or, you know, make them more useful or pay more, you know, or give them more care, um, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. I think just, we just don't know if anybody's using them. And so that's why, you know, on the slide I said, should we continue to publish them? I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. Um, it does look like a couple of questions would come in, but I'll let Jamie and David field those. Okay. Well, I, there's a couple of comments I just to make about both things. So in terms of the group, I still think it would be useful to have one comprehensive, and I, I've, I've fallen back on it, but comprehensive thing that people want to be a little less specific when they get in results, they could combine it. It would apply for a lot of clinical purposes instead of having many they have to choose from. And then maybe a second one for research things was really, really lumpy. I mean, much more, but that, that, that's all hard work. In terms of the top 2000, things don't change that much. I, 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 I never would throw it away. Uh, now, you, there's opportunities to make it more up to date. We have our hands on 9 billion um, links to link codes, but they're not all right. So we're working through, I'm mean, actually, the, the errors, I'm not sure what the error rate is, but it's a little higher than I, I presented at that last meeting. Um, so there's some little bit of a challenges in knowing for sure if they, that the numbers are right. 
but uh, but I think we'll have plenty of data. It's from thirty. It's from fifty-eight different places, so it'd be a nice. Uh, you may have other stuff too, but just so you know. Yeah, that's great, and we have no intention of throwing it away. And so we would certainly start with what we have, but. I think there's a lot that's missing, um, especially in terms of molecular testing in both infectious diseases and genetics. Well, uh, that would be really find, nice to get. You'll, you'll find is the common ones from 2000 are still common, and you'll find that the middle ones are probably about the same. And then, uh, but there might be substitutions for a given, right. you know, a given kind. And then at the tail, you'll get a lot of new stuff. Right. It, right. It, it didn't exist. So swap this, Rob, a uh, couple of comments. First, I agree with Clem. I, um, you know, I, I think if we could somehow work to create a combined release where we bring in the best parts of these various different parts into one kind of unified whole, um, that not only I, I think will increase usability, but it'll make things clearer with regards to what really belongs in a group and what doesn't, for example. I, I do think that some of the, the ideas behind what's in groups make sense. And, and so, um, you know, I, I know you understand this, but we need to be a little cautious about assuming that if people say they're not using groups, it's because they understand how to go get groups as a distinct thing and integrate them. And, right. and, I, and I think we would see different utilization if we brought it all together. Um, and I, and I, again, I think the idea of groups as a way of grouping like things that don't align with the structure of LOINC, um, you know, has value. So I suspect it's gonna continue to be valuable. But some of these other things, I think, will be, um, you know, will benefit from unifying our kind of uh, one common LOINC code system and, um, and will help us identify what things kind of fit, what things don't. I mean, each of these, to some degree, was created in a unit to kind of address a unique contextual um, desire and um, and I think it's time to think about creating one uniform link a link approach that uses the pieces that we've built. So could I just clarify are you saying you think you could have one sort of across the board um, group groupish I call them equivalence class uh, that would let users be a little less granular at will? Um, I'm not sure that I I necessarily understood that. I'm just saying that um, I think the idea of groups in LOINC is valuable and that it could be applied in a lot of various places. And so kind of integrating that into LOINC as opposed to, uh, you know, so in other words, I mean, this complicates things because LOINC is, is pretty clear with, and, and, you know, in terms of a, a use of it with regards to the various components. And, and so as we bring in these really meta, you know, kind of meta uh, organizing structures that aren't defining so much as they are using, <laughs> right. um, it, it, it will complicate what LOINC is. Um, uh, but it also, uh, you know, kind of folk allows us to focus on adding usability uh, that isn't defining, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> yeah, and I think these files help expose some of the complexity in LOINC because I think, you know, a lot of people think that it's just a flat structure, but it's really not, but we don't have a great way of showing that. And I think, it, Rob, if I understand you correctly, it, like if we had some way to sort of bring together the hierarchies and the groups and, you know, all the linkages and sort of <clears throat> show that as a or like expose that as a package and make it usable then um yeah i think <laughs> that would be amazing i guess i just you know yeah i think it you know it would force us to to probably face decisions that we haven't had to face that gets to this issue of uh you know our alignments among loink concepts valuable that are, again I, i'm going to be kind of technical but that aren't defining 
I think we would all say, yes, there are. It opens up, you know, to some degree a Pandora's box because now people could ask for all kinds of collections of links based on relationships that we aren't defining, right? So that's, you know, that's, yep. that's a Pandora's box, but, um, but it's what I think we need. And so, um, you know, the, the great thing is, is that we've kind of tested the waters by having these very separate files that only people who knew about them and could figure out how to use them and that sort of stuff would um, access. But, and so asking these questions, I think is really valuable, but the fact that they've persisted and people complain when they go away, I think, Proves their value, and now we just need to figure out how to integrate them. And so, Abner, this is David. Along these lines, we have a few, um, not so much questions, but comments. Uh, mm -hmm. Some from uh, John Snyder, um, who mentions that um, as more value set definitions are added to HL7 Fire for identifying link codes based on link parts, he mentions that the multi axial hierarchy files are going to become more important for implementers who want to build those value sets. And John also had another comment regarding the archetype capability in the groups file. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he thinks that that really makes that file more helpful than standard value sets, because that it places a link on top of a, another set of links. Um, we have uh, Xavier um, made a few, uh, made a comment noting that um, groups are now present in Odyssey vocabularies. Um, so I think that's something that is important and that we can you know look into more and he's using them investigating using groups through odyssey um, oh great okay so there are some other things happening out there um and uh yeah, yeah well, so those are the comments there so so i think i mean the thing i was talking about is there are a lot of terms in link that are really not dis that distinct now, and there's in the case of some of the microbiology specimens we got variations on things that nobody probably really cares about, you know. You know, if you if you got if you got gonorrhea in certain parts of your body, you got it. it doesn't matter as much, you know, how we call it. So those things could can we have in some of the the groups um, unified them or equivalent them. And there's a lot of other things where you just go up a step level up through. really care damn about whether the this etc some people do I mean it's important and we always want to be able to report it that way but whether these things couldn't be smushable sort of automatically at will and then some people can prune their own table so that's why I'd like to think about some you know a comprehensive thing at a level that clinicians might be okay with because we get the complaints about there's too many codes and we could we could smush that the other side of it is I think that the hierarchy it would be where I'd put my money now because it's, it's, it is universal. Uh, there are, we have connections now with some um, deep ontologies, you know, uh, that need, but need work. And this stuff is all very, very, very hard because once you start getting trees, you get an infinity of infinity of trees, you know, so just by, by the physics and the mathematics of it. So you needs a lot of manual kind of starting. And in the hierarchy, I, you know, when Shannon was working with me, we started down the path of trying to group things a little more detailed and more coherently at some of the lower levels. Because in some areas, there's the groups, the groups are just flat and wide. You know, you don't have much structure. And certainly some of the, um, some of the wilder chemicals you know, when I remember, I don't know what they are, but we got to we got to put them into groups so someone else can read them and know what they are. So I, that's why I'd put my money. I got to think we got to be careful because this isn't a billion dollar company, um, and you know when you make the investments. Right. Um, okay, so maybe I will keep going just in the interest of time, and then you know if there's more feedback, we would obviously love to hear from you, and we can uh, talk more later about this. All right, so um, uh, the next thing that we launched in June is our knowledge base. And this is really exciting because it brings together resources that previously were just available as PDFs, essentially, or sort of scattered around in different places. And it's still a work in progress, but at this point includes the link user's guide uh, and the Realma manual. 
um, some search syntax information, and then also the LINC RSNA uh, playbook user's guide, as well as the frequently asked questions in one searchable source. And we plan to keep adding to it over time. And we're thinking that we'll actually add like release notes and the readmes uh, to this knowledge base. So they're not just buried in with, you know, all of the individual files, because uh, there's a ton of information in there that, you know, could be very useful. And then um, the other thing is that recently we added um, a table essentially of abbreviations and acronyms that are used in LINC, because I know that was something that was sorely missing for a long time. So if you want to check it out, you can go to link.org slash KB and then uh, click on the abbreviations and acronyms used in LINC. And if there's ones that are uh, missing that you're looking for, uh, let us know and we'll add them. Um, another thing to update is the uh, LINC uh, Fire Terminology Services. So with the June release, we uh, upgraded to R4 of Fire. Uh, the service itself is beta, but the content is, uh, you know, either production in terms of the terms and parts or in terms of the groups as value sets, uh, the content is beta. But um, essentially the service is beta and then the content is um, mostly production. Um, so we've implemented the code system resource, concept map, value set, and questionnaire. We're actually working on code system versioning uh, right now. And with that will come the potential for publishing pre-release terms uh, via the FIRE terminology services. And that's something that we've been thinking a lot about since the pandemic started, um, you know, just because people needed the COVID terms. And so just one more slide about FIRE. Um, so we're using the code system resource to publish the terms and parts, uh, the value set resources used for answer lists, for groups, and then other named value sets, um, like all deprecated terms, uh, all document ontology terms or radiology playbook codes, um, attachment request and response codes, and a bunch of other ones. Um, and you can actually find a list of all of those on our uh, FIRE information page at link.org slash FIRE. Um, link panels are all represented as uh, R4 questionnaires. And then we have concept maps both at the term and the part level. And um, just to go back to the hierarchy for a second, you know, we're really hoping to leverage our part mappings um, to various external terminologies to help improve our internal hierarchy, which at the same, uh, sorry, not the same, which at the moment is maintained uh, manually. Um, another big thing that we've been working on is new search link, and we're gonna be giving a little bit a preview of it um, a little bit later, probably actually this afternoon. I don't think we'll have time this morning as we had originally planned. Uh, but it basically uses a new API that's connected to the LOINC database. Um, and the API currently is internal use only, but there is the potential for providing external access. And if you're interested in something like that, then you know please go ahead and contact us. But the really great thing about the API is that it's it doesn't just give access to the primary LOINC table, but you know to all sorts of other things that are included um, in LINC as well. And so you can search terms, you can also search parts and answer lists uh, and groups. So you can, you can see I'm pretty excited about this. Um, and I, I should mention that up until now, you could use Rama to look for terms, parts, and answer lists, but there's never been a way to be able to search groups. And so um, I'm super excited. We'll show you uh, this during the preview. Um, so yeah, so we're going to have a sneak peek a little bit later, and then we're also looking for uh, beta testers, and we'll tell you how to sign up for that uh, during the preview as well. What, what, what time's the, pre the preview? Well, so it was supposed to be at the end of this session, but I think um, it'll probably wind up being this afternoon. Sorry, I'm just looking at my, at my clock, um, which I think is from 2.15 to 3.45, so probably we'll start with that at 2.15. Um, another thing we've been working on um, internally um, is the LOINC management system, which is basically a web-based system for managing all of the terms, parts, answer lists, synonyms, descriptions, and everything that goes into uh, making LOINC. Um, and it's basically being developed over the last uh, several years as part of the effort to move out of access, which is where, uh, which is what we used to use to do all of the LOINC maintenance. And so it's, you know, a huge improvement we're currently working on integrating the submission system part of things also into the LMS, and then also to add panel building functionality uh, going forward. But 
um, it's just made life so much easier for uh, our terminology team. And so um, just huge thanks, uh, especially to Stephen Wagers, who's been working on this. Um, just a little bit about uh, the Q and statistics. And so um, the first, like the top uh, left screenshot, the link Q, those numbers were, uh, I got them yesterday. So requests being sets of requests. So currently in the queue, there are uh, 179 sets of requests for a total of about 2,200 terms. Um, there's a bunch that are pending copyright approval. We, you can see we've created about 400 45 since the last release. And then you see our median turnaround. And then um, the little graph, it's a little bit confusing, but basically the orange and blue lines represent individual terms and that's the axis on the left. And then uh, the axis on the right represents the number of like sets of requests. Um, that's why the numbers are so much lower. Um, and then we basically track it over time. Um, and you can see that from 2018 to 2019, the number of uh, like sets of requests uh, mm -hmm. went up quite a bit. And I think that's due to a large part because we actually instituted a policy where um, each set of requests couldn't have more than, you know, about 50 terms, give or take. Um, and so I think, you know, previously we used to get some submissions that would have hundreds of terms each. And so those have been broken up into uh, a few more sets, basically, just to make things more manageable for us. Um, a little bit about the LOINC user survey. So um, starting, uh, actually starting with this next one, it's gonna be a yearly survey, before it was twice a year. And essentially it's you know designed to assess the needs of all of you who are listening in. And we're especially interested this time to see, you know, how the needs have changed in light of the pandemic and, you know, what we can provide in order to make it easier to use LOINC um, and to make LOINC better. Um, and we'll basically take the results of the survey and um, put them together into an environmental scan and implementation plan that will inform our work uh, under our agreement with ONC. And um, anybody who wants aggregate results uh, can choose to receive those um, along, or if they, you know, if they participate, and we may actually coordinate the survey in some way with the usability testing for the new search link. So um, anyway, so if you're interested in that, you know, go ahead and sign up for that as well. And then a quick update on the link mapping guides. Um, so this is work that we're doing uh, for the FDA. And these are basically step-by-step -step guides for choosing the correct link term in various areas of, uh, of the lab, um, of lab domains. And so the current state is that, you know, microbiology was published a couple of years ago uh, for chemistry and drug talks. We've completed the pilot and then we're basically working on some revisions and need to post those two for final stakeholder review. Um, allergies in the pilot phase. We have quick start and serology that are in the draft phase and then hematology and molecular pathology are pending. Um, a few other updates. So our work with CMS, uh, we're actually in year five of five-year contract to represent all of their uh, long-term post-acute care or LTPAC instruments in blank. And our goal is actually to stay about, you know, six to 12 months ahead of when um, a particular assessment goes into effect for use by providers. Uh, so that implementers have time to implement them before the requirement goes into effect. And actually right now we're sort of in an interesting situation because um, CMS has put all of the next versions of all of the assessments on hold um, due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And so um, we've actually, you know, we have two versions. One, um, so like for ERFPI, ERFPI 3.0 is the one that's currently in effect. And then 4.0 was supposed to go in effect in October, but has been delayed for at least a year. So we actually have both versions out there. Um, for, you know, for implementers to get a head start. And then we're also working with CMS and ONC and the PASIO group and others on how to best represent functional status and her disability um, in the ISA as well. Uh, we just finished a three-year contract to represent uh, environmental exposures in Blink. Uh, we finished that in August. And basically during that work, we reviewed and mapped over um, a thousand Phenex related environmental exposure concepts. Um, we, like during that time, we 
uh, updated existing FedEx related link terms as well as created new link terms uh, where they didn't exist. And all of those mappings are published as part of our concept uh, map resource through Fire. Sure. And then, uh, is there a question? Sorry. Well, well I just wondered, uh, no, I shouldn't probably ask, but um, whether what's Dan is at RTI now <laughs> and is, is that all going well <laughs> or is it, no, I don't, maybe you can't talk. I shouldn't have asked it. Never mind. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> well, unless Dan speaks uh, up. Oh. Well, I guess what I can say is um, <laughs> the, the Phoenix collection is certainly continuing on and um, continues to grow and is a useful way for gathering input. I think there's ongoing work to sort of coalesce the different communities that are interested in this, sort of the research, I'm not gonna say versus, but the research and clinical sides that may be looking to find certain things. So. Of course, Phoenix is primarily or oriented towards uh, studies, you know, researchers doing studies, and yet there are so many crossovers. And I think um, the, uh, the shared sort of view of at what level of precision to represent these things is you know, not totally ironed out, but that's, I think, an ongoing process. I can't say that the Phoenix team is, um, is deeply committed to continuing to, um, to build the connection to LOINC and you know, doesn't uh, view itself in any way as a competitor, they're not doing the same kind of thing. Um, and they look to Lunk to continue to be the sort of semantic identifier, um, uh, you know, sort of out, out in the world. Thank you. Um, okay, and I just have a couple more slides. So our work with RSNA, um, you know, we've been talking about that for a couple of years. We actually finished the primary work to harmonize all of the content across uh, Radlex and Loink back in 2017, uh, but we've continued to work with them um, uh, mainly on you know, new content um, and how to model that uh, in the form of the Loink Radlex committee. And that committee is supposed to actually meet quarterly, but we've gotten a little bit off uh, with COVID, um, but we're, you know, we're back in touch, we're planning to kick those meetings off again. So, uh, if you are on this call and you are on that committee, then you can expect some communications uh, shortly. And then finally, um, I think this is a really cool project. We've been working with Lab Tests Online, um, which is produced by the AACC and is a trusted source of consumer-oriented lab test information. And I know like, if I'm looking for um, information about particular tests and I do a search, you know, oftentimes the Lab Tests Online pages are the ones that come up first. And we're actually collaborating with them to publish these bi-directional links, um, you know, between their pages and our pages. And currently we've published links to their top 50 and we've been, you know, expanding and, you know, updating as their top 50 changes. Um, and then there's also potential for collaborating on consumer names and then translations also with them. And they actually have 14 uh, countries and 12 languages in their global sites. And this is a bit of a busy, uh, a busy slide, but it basically shows uh, the linkages between, you know, the link terms and, you know, the details pages uh, on the left side of the screen, and then the lab tests online information on the right side of the screen. Um, and so that's actually my last slide. So if there are no further questions, I can hand it over to uh, Jamie and David for the COVID update. And otherwise, I'd be happy to answer more questions or open it up for some discussion. So I had one uh, elaboration, I guess, which is uh, to, just to mention, I see an area of opportunity for Loink and RSNA to continue working together in the area of um, their common data elements uh, project. Um, and that, that work is, is still somewhat formative, but really is building momentum. And, uh, and I think could use continued sort of encouragement to kind of keep thinking in terms of representing those items in, uh, in, in LOINC where, where appropriate. Um, and I, I've had some you know, conversation and participation in that, but I just would mention that as a, as a I guess, an outgrowth of the procedure um, term collaboration. Right, and uh, like I remember a couple of years ago, at HL7, we met with them and we talked about the work and then honestly, I just, you know, I lost track of it, but I thank you for that. And I will definitely I, I'll follow up with them. Okay, so David and I are going to give an update on the SARS COVID-19 work. 
Um, so today we've created almost 200 new terms um, for laboratory testing, clinical care, and public health reporting. Um, all of the um, terms that we have created are based on requests from LINC users, and we continue to work closely pretty much weekly with APHL, CDC, FDA, labs, manufacturers, and other stakeholders on how best to manage all of these concepts. In the next release, in addition to a lot of new tests, we will also have several codes for multiplex assays, um, including those that detect um, influenza A and B, RSV, and as well as SARS um, for the nucleic acid or molecular tests, and then um, the same, you know, similar assays for detecting the antigens. Um, and we continually receive uh, requests, and as we receive those, we try to process the codes as quickly as possible um, and get them released within a couple days usually. Um, so the work that we do for SARS um, and the codes that we create are kind of on a different cycle than our routine submissions. Um, and so the goal is then to get those codes distributed as quickly as possible so that they can be used and implemented. Um, we've also, we're currently working on a project with the CDC um, to create codes for setting and region level counts. Um, so like the total of number of cases within, um, since the beginning of the pandemic or within a certain reporting period. We're also creating codes for the number of deaths, um, increase and decrease in cases between reporting periods, um, number of beds, ICU beds, um, and then counts for healthcare providers as well for each of these things. Um, all of these codes will be included in the CDC emergency operations um, minimum data set collection. We also have been, we initially had one website or one web page that was dedicated to all the SARS CoV-2 or COVID-19 um, work. Um, but now we split that out into two. Um, we have one that's dedicated to IVD test kit information and other um, key mapping guidance for link coding. Um, and then we have another web page, and I'll show these in a minute, uh, for, that supports a download of all the link terms um, related to uh, SARS CoV 2 and testing and reporting. Um, these web pages are updated daily with new or edited terms. They include lab terms as well as uh, terms related to the case reporting, clinical documentation, ask it order entry, um, and so on. And um, this page of note contains released and pre-release terms. And I'm going to show those here. So this page is the one that's the guidance for mapping SARS-CoV-2 terms. Um, it contains uh, information. We actually are pointing, David's going to talk next about the LIVID file. And so we initially had mappings here on this page to IVD um, test kits and laboratory developed tests, but all of that information has been um, a part of the LIVID file, which we would recommend using and is kept up to date uh, weekly. And then this page talks about the help with choosing the right link code based on the method, um, the system, or specimen that's used, uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Um, and then the analyte that's being uh, targeted, so the antigen. Uh, there's a code for reporting the whole genome for the virus. Um, and you can just, you can see this for yourselves. We also at the bottom of the page have frequently asked questions um, that were especially popular at the beginning of the pandemic where there was lots of discussion over what it was called, um, what we should refer to it as. Uh, so you can just see that here. Um, and then there's also a way to contact us if you have any questions. So the other page where you can view the full list of terms um, on this page, the terms are broken out by lab tests. And then, sorry, I'm scrolling pretty fast. There's an ask it order entry questions section, uh, the convalescent plasma terms, uh, and then terms related to public health case reporting. And then lastly, I believe the section is on uh, clinical notes. 
documents related to telehealth to help users be able to find these. Um, on this page, if you're logged in, is how you have to be logged in actually to um, export the codes to a CSV file. So once I'm logged in, now I have a, down at the bottom here, um, a button that I can push to say export data. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to David now um, to talk about the Livid file. Oops. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna talk um, about are some other efforts that Loink has been involved in to get the COVID um, SARS-CoV-2 terms out there and to help users select the appropriate correct um, Loink term. Now you, you probably know about the uh, Livid effort and Livid specification. Um, basically, it's a way of cross-referencing -refer um, specific in vitro diagnostic tests or assays to LOINC. Um, and the intention is that as LOINC becomes available from, um, you know, in vitro diagnostic assay manufacturers and vendors under LIVID, this will facilitate um, the selection of, of correct LOINC codes to be used by the all the individual laboratories that employ that specific assay. So the Livid file for um, SARS-CoV-2 lab tests is available uh, on the CDC website. Um, this file is a joint effort by the public health labs, by the CDC, the FDA, our team, and IVD manufacturers. Basically, we meet weekly, uh, we have, um, you know, we have a meeting weekly with this group and we discuss basically all the new tests that have come out. We discuss, you know, all the new EUAs, emergency use authorizations that the FDA has approved that week. And we uh, make sure that those new assays have appropriate LOINC terms. So our turnaround for getting that file updated is very quick. So within, within the week that the FDA produces an EUA, we will um, make sure that an, uh, an existing loan term is mapped or that we uh, create and uh, the appropriate loan term if it does not already exist. Uh, we can take a quick look at that file. Um, let's go to this uh, page so you can see what that looks like. So now we're on the CDC website and this is the, the page that hosts that file and you can download it here where it says mapping tool. When you click here, it'll actually download the Excel file to um, your computer, which looks, I'm gonna have to pull it over from a different screen, but I'll just give you a quick preview of the file. So it looks like this. Um, there are a number of uh, fields that describe the manufacturer and model. There are fields that include SNOMED concept codes for the specimen, the various specimens that that assay can um, can uh, work on. There's result description. So the actual result answers are SNOMED coded. Here are the LOINC coding um, fields where there's a code for the LOINC result, a code, a code for the LOINC order, and then there are additional fields that refer to equipment IDs. And you might notice, and what's a little confusing uh, sometimes when you first look at this file is that the manufacturer and model can be identical in two rows. So you might wonder why there are multiple rows. Uh, and that's because this assay can actually be performed on several different instruments. So uh, that equipment, each, each uh, instrument actually has a unique row in here. Um, so that accounts for the, the number. So the, the most recent file had, uh, let me just jump back to my uh, slides for a second. So the most recent file had 365 rows, but those 365 rows um, actually represented 254 unique assays. Um, so this has been a, a really important effort, I think, in getting out there what the correct link codes are to use for the specific assays. Um, there are three LOINC groups. 
uh, that were published in the June release, uh, release 2.68, that uh, show long terms related to the detection of SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, laboratory testing. So there are these three groups. One group includes basically all the long terms. Another group includes the molecular detection long terms. And the other group, uh, the third group, uh, is for the antibody, serologic antibody testing. There's also a value set um, for terms related to COVID-19 case reporting. Um, and these are all available and you can view them um, on the LOINC uh, website. If we could just click on one just to see what you get to see. Basically LOINC.org followed by the group code and you get a list of all those um, LOINC terms in that group. Um, going back here, if we look at the Fire Terminology, terminology Services homepage, um, you can see where where these groups are available from the from the fire server. So there's a new set under public health value sets and the three value sets representing those laboratory um, terms and the one value set for health, uh, the case reporting terms are all available from the, the fire loink.org um, fire page. When you say if you were to open one of these, what you get is basically the expanded set. The first uh, link has the defining information about that group, and the second link has the expanded set of all the, the terms included. So that is really all I had to um, uh, to say, so please um, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Well, David, well, David, you guys are all doing a terrific amount of work and good work, but you know, you raise the question. I count now maybe four different ways you can group things. There's the class. I mean, they have different you know, scopes, so I'm not going to say they should all mm -hmm. be combined. You got tags, which hasn't been named in a long time. You got um, groups and you got panels. So some, uh, there's too many. Someday one mm -hmm. needs to do something. And some of these things smell like panels to me, but you know, the convenience panels, but there may be just, just want to get you thinking about how you can reduce the, the number. Yeah, of those. Clem, I think you make a really good point because, you know, when we talk about groups, you know, we hope that, you know, I think the assumption could be made that we're talking about a less granular concept that subsumes by an is a relationship concepts underneath it. So that's kind of what my thinking is, but you're absolutely right that in the case of this group, the public health case reporting group, um, that actually is a collection of fields within a public health uh, well, questionnaire. Well, so I you're right that I that, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't think of it that way. It's a classic panel and it can get turned into a form. Right. Yeah. A form, right. right? Yeah. Can, can I just uh, this just jump in and say this is exactly why I think we need to bring all this stuff into one kind of uniform whole because the overlap and alignment between them I think is even confusing us. I absolutely agree with Clem because what you just described to me sounds like what Moink has traditionally created panels for. So. Um, you know, I think it's time to kind of clean our house by bringing all the pieces together and deciding how we want to use them. And if I could add, just some of these things have been developed over time. So I think we started, you know, we started with panels and then internally in the link structure, we added this mechanism to add tags and then we developed groups and now we're, you know, creating fire value sets. Uh, so yeah, I agree. And we, you know, we struggle with this and we try to figure out Oops, sorry, and I realized my video on, but yeah, we've been trying to figure out, you know, what to do and how best to bring all these things together and what is the best path going forward because it's really hard to maintain all this or, you know, or even to say like, when should we, <laughs> when should we do one versus the other because it's, there's so much overlap. In terms of the public health value set though, I do want to um, just point out that different, like WHO and CDC and different countries have different sets of data elements. And so that value set doesn't actually represent one single, like it doesn't represent the CDC COVID, uh, you know, case reporting form. It represents sort of a superset of concepts that are used across different types of 
case reporting forms. Yeah, so, this is, well, for, first thing I would say is uh, excellent work. So grateful for, for the work that's being done. And, uh, and the fact that you're involved with CDC and the FDA and uh, the public health laboratories. And are we, I'm wondering, are we, you've created great relationships, I'm thinking, to get this work done. And is it formalized in a way so that when the next pandemic comes, we'll be set to do this faster and more efficient? Uh, you know, so that my, my guess is right now that, you know, you've, you've created good relationships, but, you know, six months of, if there's turnover in personnel or other things, you would lose the links. <laughs> uh, is there a way to formalize this so that we have, uh, you know, you would know who to call, you know, the next pandemic to say, you know, uh, join us on the call now. We need to start making loin codes for the next, you know, the next set of diseases. And it, so, is and there a formalization right? around that? Um, do you know if it's part of the FDA emergency youth authorization to have a loin code yet? Because that was what we had talked with them about is I don't think so. Part of that submission. I don't think, right. No. I don't think it is. And Stan, to answer your question, it's not formalized in any way. I think it just sort of started, you know, as part of the shield effort and then we've just kept going. But yeah, I mean, you know, obviously with Mike's passing, we've been at a loss on, you know, well, what do we do? Because he was part of those weekly calls. And so yeah, we no, actually... That's, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. You know, it, it, I mean, again, it's wonderful that we've done what we've done. Uh, but you lose somebody like Mike and then, you know, it's maybe like there's no glue anymore you know, to bring people together. Uh, and it, it would be great if we could not become too formal, but have, have some formal connections so that as, as personnel change and other things happen, uh, we don't lose the valuable capability that, that we've had in creating the COVID terms. And so, yeah. That's a really good point. And and going back to, you know, I agree that we ought we ought to, you know, get um, maybe we need maybe it's a new work group or a new something, you know, that convenes to talk about panels and um, you know, panels and value sets and groups and and sort of that whole area. I think I mean there there overlaps, but I I think there are very different use cases as well. And so I don't, I don't think they're one thing. I think they're different things and we just need to clarify what the purpose of each thing is and, and, and then follow those, you know, and create recommendations basically about when you use which things for what. Uh, and there's a part of it, you could even, I, you could even argue, I, I mean, so this is a little tangential, but, I mean, you think about um, you think about panels like loink, you know, the loink panels for for laboratory, and and those are of great value because they they connect to ordering behaviors, and you can use them in decision logic and other ways, and know deterministically what you're going to get back about those things. There are other things that are collections of things. And so you could think of, for instance, um, the set of loint codes that would report on, uh, you know, uh, a three month prenatal exam uh, or, or a cardiac uh, examination, et cetera. And, and there I could almost argue that those things um, either shouldn't be part of the link or they should have a separate existence from true panels because the, the set of things that people may want to collect in a clinical setting is going to change over time. And there's no way, well, if, if it's a usable, if you want to have a set that's reusable so people can look and say, well, what are, what are people collecting when, when they do a heart exam? Uh, that's, 
in a sense, it, it would be nice to have a set of those, but not regulate it because in, in a sense, because people may want to have different things that they collect in cardiac things and you can track it, but not regulate it. If you know what I mean? Uh, it, uh, anyway, there's bottom line is I think it would be good to have, you know, set up some regular meetings to talk about and define the differences between those groups and, and determine an approach to making it rational. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Actually, unfortunately, we need to actually um, end this session, which is supposed to end 10 minutes ago, because we can't launch the next one until this one ends. But we are reconvening this meeting um, in a couple of hours. So maybe we can take up with that. And there's also one question related to uh, COVID and diagnostic tests and lot numbers um, from Anna from the FDA. And so maybe we can uh, start off with that as well at the, at the next. It's a 2.15 Eastern. Uh, is when that next combined meeting starts. Stan, Stan, I think yeah. you're saying Thank you. you'd like to institutionalize these connections, but boy, it's tough with the government. It's just tough. I, you know, they don't have any permanent kind of hooks uh, that you can, you know, so, but that's what we should probably, I guess, push for. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and end this meeting, but we will see you uh, in the next session in just a few minutes. I guess maybe we'll launch the next session, but maybe we'll start in 10 minutes so everybody gets a little break. <laughs>